Kids, welcome back. Raise your hand if this is your first time coming to a Camp K12 talk. Raise your hand if it's your first Camp K12 talk. Nice. Some new people. I see Vedika. I'm guessing that's your mom's name. I see Skandan and Ahan and uh, Sarveswar. Uh, Jesuda, that may or may not be your name or your parents' name. Very nice to meet you guys who are coming for the first time. You can put your hands down. Put your hands down. We do, we do a Camp K12 talk every month. And every month, our goal is to invite someone who has applied in their life the very things that you learn and are learning with Camp K-12. So people who started building at a young age and then went on to create with large tech companies, with their own startups, with their own organizations. And our goal when we do these sessions is to give you and your parents, if they want to sit next to you, that's totally fine. You can invite your parents to give you and your parents a chance to ask questions to our speakers to understand the kind of life they lived when they were in school and how it led to the great things that they've gone on to do. Because at the end of the day, Camp K-12 is a global online school for 21st century skills. And our goal is to give you at a young age, the skills that you will need to succeed in the, in the life that you're going to live in today's world. And therefore, we think that in addition to giving you the curriculum and the time and the space to learn with us, it's also great to build this community where you can hear directly from people who are out there making things happen and applying these skills. So today, guys, I'm, I'm actually very excited about today's speaker because it's a topic we're going to be talking about many topics. And one of the topics is self-driving cars. It's something that if you are in the high school program at Camp K-12 or in the middle school program at Camp K-12, and you are towards the later part of your learning path, you know, in your sixth month to the 12th month, you will be learning how to build your own self-driving car systems. And those of you who haven't yet taken that course on how to build your own lane detection and object detection systems, those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, self-driving cars is a very exciting technology which will allow cars to drive themselves. That's why it's called self-driving cars, driverless cars and autonomous vehicles. These are all phrases that you will hear. Now, those of you who are in these classes and those of you who have been in the last few Camp K-12 talks we've done, where we've had speakers coming from working in AI and machine learning at different companies like Twitter and Facebook, you, you have asked us many times how a self-driving car works. Uh, what is this technology? What is the role that AI will play in my life? Parents ask us, why should my child get fam familiar with the concepts of AI, of machine learning? What, what's the relevance of these to the life that we are going to live? And, you know, we, we're really grateful today that we have someone who can talk firsthand about all of these things because our guest today works on self-driving cars uh, at a company called Waymo which is, uh, it used to be part of Google's self-driving car unit and then spun off. And uh, now he's working with them based out of London. Prior to this, he was working with them based out of uh, Silicon Valley, California, I think Mountain View, California. Is that right, uh, Ashwin? Yeah. And, and so we're really Absolutely. grateful that today we have someone who can speak about this experience firsthand. And he also happens to be someone who can speak about all the other things you guys like to ask about, which is, hey, um, tell me about the college system in India. Tell me about the college system in the US. Ashwin is someone who, during his school days where he was in Pune, uh, ended up, he has a fun story, which I would let him share, but he ended up going to IIT Bombay, studying computer science at IIT Bombay. And then his life took him to many different places. And we'll cover some of those, but you can talk to Ashwin about uh, school days. You can talk to him about IIT days. You can talk to him about working at Google. You can talk to him about studying for his MBA in the US at Harvard University. You can talk to him about AI and machine learning. You can talk about careers that AI opens up for you in, in actually software development, but also something that he does, which is a product manager role. We'll talk about what that is. And ultimately, what is the future of this technology, right? And what can you do as kids and parents? What can you do for your kids to help your children have the right skills and the, and the training for the world that they're going to live in. That's what we're here to talk about. So without any further ado, let me introduce Ashwin. Uh, Ashwin, we would like to give you a Camp K-12 welcome. So everyone join me in a round of, round of applause, please, to welcome our guests. Thank you, Anshul. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for making time on an early morning in London time uh, to, to join us here. We're very excited to have you. And I'm sure that the kids have tons of questions for you. So uh, why don't you just introduce yourself briefly and tell us where you are. Give us a sense of your life right now. 
Um, sure. So, you know, uh, like Anshul mentioned, my name is Ashwin. I grew up in Pune. Uh, right now, I'm in London. I actually moved here just uh, two months ago. So uh, I don't yet have a permanent place of my own, uh, which is why you see this uh, strange background behind me. Uh, I'm living in an Airbnb. For those of you who have, uh, who might have done that, this is uh, where at someone else's house, yeah, because of the lockdown, they decided to go to their bigger house in the country. Their smaller house was available. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, we are staying there right now. Um, I, you know, like Anshul mentioned, I work with Waymo, which earlier was, no, you know, it started off its life 11 years ago almost. as And at that time, it was called uh, Google's self-driving car project. Um, I've been with Waymo for almost a year and a half, two years now. Um, and, you know, as we as we get more into the details, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what kinds of problems I am solving with Waymo. Uh, and I think the other bit about you know, where, where in terms of where I'm at right now, uh, I I love to travel. So and you know, we me and my wife, we've always wanted to uh, you know live and travel in Europe. And so as soon as the lockdown lifts, I'm you know I'm looking forward to being able to. Uh, travel here, um, figure out how roads here work, because one day we would want self-driving cars to automatically drive on the roads of uh, you know, London and Delhi and uh, Pune and Chennai and you know wherever it is that all of you guys are coming from. Uh, so I'm looking forward to being able to move around very soon. Awesome. Thank you, Ashwin, for the introduction. I think what we will do today, guys, is we're going to start by just showing you a video that Ashwin has shared up front. And the video will explain to you what are self-driving cars and what is Waymo. It's a three-minute video, if I'm not mistaken, and it's on YouTube. So what I'm going to do is just to set the context. I'm going to show that video to you. And after we watch that video, you will have an understanding of what Ashwin works on today at this company, building self-driving cars. And then we're gonna rewind the clock back to Ashwin's childhood days. I see that some people here are in grade three. I think the youngest uh, person we have in this thread, in this meeting, oh, we have a grade two person, Tanish. Uh, Tanish is in grade two. So we have some second graders here. And I would like Ashwin to, after we watch that video, take us back to second grade, when he was in second grade. And I would like him to talk to you a little bit about what he was doing in those days. So let me switch to my screen share and then I will show you guys a video. And while Anshul brings up that video, the person you see talking in the video is uh, an engineer called Nathaniel Fairfield. Uh, he's one of my colleagues at Waymo. In fact, he was one of the people who interviewed me before I joined Waymo. He has been working on this problem for more than 15 years now. So I think one of the, one thing I would like to say up front is in order to get to a place like this, it is a long, long journey. So he studied computer science, of course, many, many years ago uh, when he was as young as you are. And it is 15 years of his hard work and effort and perseverance uh, that allows him to, you know, be, be speaking to you today through this video. Awesome. So let's let's go for it. And let me know, guys, if you can hear the audio when I start playing it. Can you hear it? Thumbs up. My name is Nathaniel Fairfield. I'm a software yes. engineer. Back when we started this, we were the Google self-driving car project. And self-driving cars didn't really exist. Thinking about our first thousand miles and then our first 10,000 miles and our first hundred, first million, you've actually got breadth and diversity of mileage. And you start to see some of the patterns of driving. The 10 million mile milestone is about 10 lifetimes of driving. It's a huge amount of experience that we've gained across the country in all kinds of driving conditions. And it takes that kind of experience to learn all of these lessons to really make that possible. How does Waymo see the ball before anyone else? It's always looking. It's always looking in all directions. The lasers are what lets it spot a small moving object that's approaching towards the car and estimate its position and velocity very precisely. So this is a very interesting case where there's actually a couple with a dog. At the same time, a jogger is just passing by and the jogger swings around the dog out of the bike lane into the road. The car doesn't just understand where the agents are. It actually understands how they're going to interact in the near future and is able to make those predictions in the blink of an eye before you really understand 
exactly what's going on. This is night construction, which, you know, as a, as a human driver is one of the more stressful things. The car handles it really, really, really well because the car sees as well at night as it does during the day. For the lasers and for the radars, they see where the cones are, where that aisle of traffic that's being laid out here by the construction zone is going. Red lights and green lights, they're really important, but people sometimes don't obey that. In a case like this, where the red light runner happened, the car is actually checking all around in all directions all at once. And so it can see when there's somebody coming who looks like, wait, they're not really slowing down for their red light. And at some point we decided, wait, they actually look like they're gonna run the red light. Let's stop and let them go through. And then after they've gone, you know, on we go. The thing that's amazing about this one is that you can't see in, in dust storms like these. There's actually a pedestrian out there. The car sees perfectly well in advance. We're just walking across the road. The car sees it using its lasers and radars and starts slowing down. Is it lagging for you guys? I'm hearing a message. Is it lagging? Okay, it's lagging. So what I'll do, Ashwin, is at this mm -hmm. point, I'll just pause it here and I'll share the, I'll share the link of the video on the chat thread so people can watch it on their end. Is that fine? Oh, oh I think uh, part? No, I think I think the your camp kit was official, and I think one of the stu students shared the link. I also typed it in twice, so uh, you know maybe what oh, we can do take a few minutes yeah. uh, and give let folks see it on their own. Or you know what? I think they probably saw enough to mm -hmm. be able to understand. So of I course. don't want to use the precious time we have with you live to ask them to watch a video. So let's actually let them watch that on their own time later. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So that's uh, Kate, the, the goal of showing you that video is just to set the context of what is a self-driving car and what kind of technology that Ashwin and his team are building at Waymo. And that might give you some appreciation for how um, the kind of life that Ashwin has lived to prepare for this moment where he's trying to build a world-changing technology with his his team. And, I, and as you can see, there's a lot of AI and machine learning, what we call computer vision, where you have sensors on the car and you are always watching as the gentleman in the video was saying, and you're always figuring out how much to rotate the car to drive left, drive right, speed up, slow down. You know, that's, that's a, it's a very complex technology system. And I think we should ask Ashwin about how his life led him to really do what he does today to work on such an important technology. And as I mentioned, he's gone from in his school days being in Pune to then being at Bo in Bombay for IIT Bombay. Uh, then he actually moved to, uh, he was at a consulting company with some of your parents might know called McKinsey and Company, after which he did an MBA from Harvard Business School in Boston, and then went to Google as a product manager, if I'm not mistaken, right, Ashwin? Mm -hmm. And then finally to Waymo. So we're gonna rewind the clock to second grade. And uh, Ashwin, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about what your, uh, What's your, see, typically when I invite people, I ask them, what was your first line of code that you wrote? In your case, because I know that you are a builder in a much more holistic sense, I, I'm going to ask you about what are the first projects you created, whether they're coding or not. Tell us about your journey in school days as a builder. Uh, definitely. Um, happy to. And I think maybe the one story that I'd like to share, to, to, to start off the story that I'd like to share is... Um, how many of you here have heard of Morse code? M-O-R-S-E, Morse code. Okay, I can see Sarveshwar has his hand up, Ahan has his hand up, a few other people. Uh, perfect. So for those of you who may not have heard of it, a uh, Morse code is a very, very simple communication language. You know, if if I want to send you a message and all I have is one bit, I only have a zero or a one, which I'm sure has people who are studying coding and computer science, you might've heard of it. Uh, you know, how do I send across a message? So uh, the way it works is a Morse code has dots and dashes. So just two states. And then if I want to say, you know, for example, if I want to send you a message that says SOS, I may say, I send you dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. And that's kind of, that is one of the most popular messages. Um, this, uh, you know, and Morse code is also, you know, if you, Think far, far back before we had computers, before we had the internet. This is the kind of messaging that you can do on long distances, uh, maybe using just a light, right? You turn the light on, you can call that a dash. And then you keep the light off, you can call that a dot. Or even if you go even further back, before there were electric lights, right? You could use smoke signals. So you light a fire and it starts making some smoke. And then you hold a piece of towel over it 
and you remove the towel a little bit of smoke goes up you put the towel back on you wait for one second and you do it again and if someone is very very far away from you they will see these little puffs of smoke come and if you do it right they can you know they can know that a piece of smoke is a dot and if there is no smoke for a little bit of time that's a dash so anyway, that's what morse code is about and one of the earliest projects that i remember building this is probably when i was in second second or third grade uh, mm-hmm. you know as as old as some of you uh, so i built a, a a class project which was a morse code receiver transmitter um and my grandfather helped me build this um he in fact was you know he used to uh, work in telecommunications and he was responsible for, you know he was responsible for the team that built uh, india's first earth satellite station so those big you know big dishes on the ground that were you know, very similar to your uh, dish tv or tata sky antenna except much much larger that can talk directly to satellites so he set up the first such dish uh, at, uh, at this place called rv and you know, i still have you know memories of going there as a 6 you know, or 7 year old and uh, you know we were able to get access there and we went up and i still re- i remember going up through a really tiny staircase in the center column and then actually like a small window opens out onto the dish and the dish is actually really huge it's like it's as big as a nice swimming pool um so anyway so with his help i built this you know i i basically built a very very simple circuit we had uh, you know your normal um your double a size batteries we had some bits of wire uh, we created a we created a keyboard a keyboard which was just a a piece of metal and another place on which it can make contact so you can just do this tapping like this and then the circuit on the other side you know flashes a light and then my friend and i you know we copied down the whole morse code um, and what the way we did it is instead of having to count how many times the light goes on and off we gave ourselves four four bits so you could see dots and dashes you could see them move four at a time so it was like a little think of it as a as the most basic screen on which you can see four uh, dots and dashes at one time um, and then we took a really long wire and you know between my house and his house which was a couple of doors away uh, we ran the wire and then we could uh, you know we could talk to each other without using the telephone which we thought was quite cool um, this doesn't sound like a class project ashwin it, it was it started off as a class project and, uh, and then we figured out that the the you know the way to you know all we needed was a longer piece of wire um and uh, you know because you know when, when i was a kid um, you know all the you know cable companies would lay these cable wires so you had wires from rooftops all over the place so nobody noticed one additional piece of wire uh, and so we threw a wire and and we could you know talk to each other until uh, until our parents decided that it was taking up too much of our time so they said now you should go and study and stop tinkering with this mm-hmm. um, so yeah that was one i can also tell you a little bit more about what we did with the batteries after they were exhausted uh, but uh, until, <laughs> until you uh, you you guide me here tell me if when you want to, when you want to I, I would love to know if that's what you were building in second grade what were so you building in one, third grade fourth grade no, so yeah. the third, you know, so second and third grade was the morse code thing uh, yeah. a little further along maybe this this was probably fifth fourth or fifth grade i think uh, when we made this thing that is called as a carbon arc and i was telling anshul about this yesterday i think the the first thing i want to say is do not try this at do not try this without appropriate supervision uh, you know i was supervised my by my grandfather who knew what he was doing um, but you know if again depending on which um, which which standard you guys are studying in uh, you you know you may or may not have heard of uh, you know are you familiar with uh electricity and voltage and uh, you know ions and particles yes i see a few thumbs up okay. uh, give, give me a few thumbs up if you guys know what uh, voltage is okay i see a few fo- few more thumbs up great okay so uh you know very very simply put uh, uh voltage is you know gives you the idea of how powerful a certain electric source can be so your little a4 cell you know that is usually you know you know one and a half two volts so that is very very low the the switch inside your house uh, that is 230 volts right that's why you you never put your finger into the switch and turn the light on because you will get electric shock um 
and what happens when you get you know what happens in the case of an electric shock is you know when electricity flows through something it creates a lot of energy uh, if unfortunately it you know it flows through you you get a shock um, but the interesting thing is electricity can even flow through air um, the what you need to do for it is to bring the voltage points very very close together so this is the other project that i did when i was in in third or fourth standard i think this is when in some science class we were learning about ions and how a tube light works and something like that and i remember asking my grandfather uh, how does this you know how does a tube light actually work and i know i know the theory you know there is a, there is glass and there is some inert gas in it and then you put some voltage and electricity passes through the gas and that creates energy and that comes out in the form of light right so so we all, we knew the theory uh, and you can't really open up a tube light because if you open up a tube light the gas escapes and then it no longer works and so i wanted to understand more as like i don't you know i want to know more about how this works can i make my own tube light um and so he said no we can't really make a tube light because we don't have you know it needs a lot of specialized equipment but we can try to make something um that is you know that is called as a carbon arc so what we did is we took uh, you know we took your small a4 battery yeah you know, break it open there is a bunch of powder in it you throw that powder away but anyway, all this you have to do wearing gloves uh, because uh, you know it's not good to handle these things so you throw that away at the center there is a little there is a little black rod which is basically just carbon right? and so we took two carbon rods we attached we attached wooden handles to them so we wouldn't have to touch them ourselves um uh, and then created an electrical you know circuit around them uh created a little fuse so just like the fuse that is in your house so you know if uh, if electricity flows through something that where it shouldn't go through the fuse burns off you know you say oh the fuse is blown electricity in the whole house goes off goes off that is for your safety so similarly we created a little fuse out of uh, using a little bit of salt water uh and then you know using our two wooden handles you you take the two pieces of carbon together you touch them just a little bit so creates a small spark and then you slowly draw it apart and when you slowly draw it apart what happens is that little spark that spark creates enough energy for electricity to start flowing uh, through the air and then you can slowly draw it apart and you can almost get you know it's a very very bright source of light and you can almost get it to be like a couple of centimeters wide um uh, so of course you know um uh, what grade was this what grade was this ashwin uh this was probably 4th or 5th grade 4th or 5th grade and this was not a class project i'm guessing this is not a class project this was done no. at home uh this is done at home this was done with a uh you know with a lot of good supervision um you know we made sure that we had the right um uh, safety equipment such as the yeah. fuse such as the gloves uh such as the you know wooden handles to make sure and also sunglasses because this gets really really right. bright uh so this light is actually bright enough that you can use it so in the olden days uh, you know when you go to a cinema hall and you see the projector right if you look back up above all of the seats you there's a small window through which uh, mm-hmm. the projector light is coming out uh, so this is the kind of light that they use there it's extremely bright uh, and hence it can you know travel a far distance so this is something i built in like fourth and fifth standard so I, I'm um, noticing a trend here, Ashwin. So, with the first example you gave, you took a class project and you extended it. It wasn't required for your grade, but you you extended it. It seemed like you had friends with which you could do these projects. Mm-hmm. And then with this more recent project, I think what I heard you say is you wanted to understand how something works. You wanted to understand how a, a tube light works, and that was the question. And then it led to this whole exploration process. and creating something that didn't exist before which i think all of these young coders here are familiar with that feeling you know when something doesn't exist and you bring it into existence through the code that you write uh coding again is just one of many ways you can create right and i think ashwin is giving us an example of the same concept which is to create something to solve a problem but with a very different uh mechanism and a very different means he was someone who used to create something from nothing if you guys look at stories of 
the the successful entrepreneurs that we have talked about many times in past sessions we've talked about mark zuckerberg and how in second grade third grade or fifth grade he he started to code every day we talked about bill gates and how when he was going to high school he started to code every day uh, do you guys know what steve jobs was doing thumbs up kids if you know what steve jobs was doing in school middle school it actually sounds a lot like what ashwin was doing steve jobs was not a coder steve jobs was a builder and and a breaker apart or whatever you call that right he used to disassemble and assemble things so i think when i hear ashwin stories of uh wanting to understand how the electronics uh, or the the devices in his home work i think about steve jobs story of breaking apart a radio breaking apart a television and putting it back together on his own just to understand how it works and that pursuit of how something works i think is a is a much more fundamental sort of learning then the kind of textbook learning that you do in school when you're motivated by wanting to answer a question for true curiosity i that's something i'm hearing in ashwin's journey so ashwin tell us a little bit about about what you did maybe when you were a little older like did this continue did you continue to build stuff and if it changed like how how did it change what happened in middle school and in high school uh sure so i think um, you know, like you mentioned you know i've always i've always liked exploring how things work and uh, trying to see if you know within reason if i can you know make them work a little bit differently i think i've always been curious yeah. so if you know if you see something working you're like oh why doesn't it do this other thing right. uh, you know that's that's always been a thing and i, I can go you know there's another uh, interesting story that i can later share about my time in college um, when in the this is 2004 so may, maybe maybe this is like slightly before uh so, you know so, some of you guys were around and watching cricket but uh, in the 2004 cricket world cup we created was a big thing most of my memories of middle school um are actually of reading a lot so i used to read a lot of books um uh, you know i for those of you who might know this who might know these books so enid blyton who's a famous author so you know famous five secret seven if if these names ring a bell uh, read a lot of those books uh, read a, read a lot of uh, hardy boys and nancy drew kind of books uh, also i mean did did read a little bit of non fiction but for the most time, for the most part it was all of these uh, story books and uh, i remember me and a couple of friends we were like very avid readers so there was this for a few years in between we were uh, maybe from 5th standard all the way to like 8th or so um i was actually reading a book every almost a one book a day but definitely one book every two days um and if you think about it it's you know if you have a if you have a 150 page book um you know usually like of this size um it's actually not that hard after with with some practice once you start if you read a lot you also get faster at reading and i think I had become quite a quite a fast reader uh, so you can actually do a page in less than a minute so then you are doing 60 pages in 1 hour and if the book has 150 pages it's only 2 and a half hours and you now uh, between uh, after doing my homework after coming back uh, you know before dinner a little bit after dinner you could, could easily finish that um, and i think what i learned from you know i think one was you know just reading all these books ends up kind of allowing you to imagine uh, which then is ex- which comes in ex- later comes extremely in handy uh, when you're trying to build something because a lot of what you need before you build is you need to imagine right so you need to imagine what would i want this to uh, look like what would i want this to work like um, and it also the other thing i think reading all of those books gave me which i you know still value a lot is it it improved my ability to communicate so with all these books you learn how to tell a story you improve your vocabulary and later you know you know today maybe when you're coding you're coding a small project on your own but tomorrow when you want to do a bigger project you will want to work with other people and you will want to work with three four five friends maybe you want to start a company and when you do that one of the most important skills that you will that you know you will really want is being able to talk to people in a way that they understand very easily what you're saying and i think all of that reading 
uh, really set me up very well for those kinds of things. Ashwin, I think there's one other thing that you perhaps picked up and I'm trying to connect the dots here between what you just shared and what I know about your IIT days and how you got into IIT. I think one other thing you perhaps picked up is how to acquire information really quickly. And I want you to, um, I want you to talk a little bit because some of the students in this, in this uh, Zoom call are a little mm-hmm. older. They're in the high school age mm-hmm. where they're thinking about college. You have a very unusual way of preparing for IITs. And look, we have yes. had a lot of, we have had a lot of guest speakers in, in, in the last few months who have gotten into IIT, but they've done it by, you know, taking the coaching classes and going to the coaching centers and through the whole process. And I think because you are who you are and you'd kind of been building and imagining and acquiring information in such large volumes. Uh, you told me when we were talking about this session that you didn't actually go through any of that. So talk about your journey in high school and how, how did you actually prepare? How did you get into I- IIT Bombay and that too, from what I understand, like I didn't grow up in the Indian college system, but from what I understand, computer science at IIT Bombay is not something that's easy to get. And, and so how did you actually end up being so successful in the, traditional academic system of India while pursuing your hobbies, like tinkering at a young age, building things with electronics and circuitry and reading so prolifically, uh, how did you actually achieve that? Um, so that, that's high praise that you're putting on me. I will, I will try to, as, as my cup says, I will uh, try to keep it simple. Um, so I think the, so back when, you know, when I was in ninth standard and, no, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. Back then, um, in Pune, we actually did not have any coaching classified. I think we maybe just had just one and very few people actually went there because the awareness was not uh, as much as it is now. Right Right now, you know, you, you guys who are in 4th and 5th standard also know about IIT. I, I honestly didn't know about IIT until I got into 11th standard. So in 11th standard, I noticed that, you know, there was the syllabus. Uh, which had you know maths, physics, chemistry, etc. But then there were some of my friends who were trying to solve these problems that were harder and uh, more interesting. And that's and I said, oh, what, what is this? And they're like, oh, this is for the IIT entrance exam. And I, I'm not kidding you. That is the first time that I actually read up and I was like, oh, this is actually a really good engineering college. If I if I get there, I should go. Uh, and because there was no coaching class, uh, I think I ended up doing most of my uh, studying with a couple of friends and you know one of them in particular um, you know, I, I, I very distinctly remember we used to uh, you know, we used to go by cycle from he used to he lived, lived close to my house and uh, my 11th and 12th uh, college or like college as junior college as it's called in Pune school as it's called in many other parts of India that was about a 20, 20 minute cycle ride away so we used to bicycle together and come back together and uh, you know, we, he he said to me, he said, look, we have to, you know, we don't have a good coaching class to go to, but we want to try really hard for IIT. So we should do this on our own. So let's make a plan. And so we made a plan. And the plan was first we would, you know, finish up everything that was uh, in our regular syllabus. We also got a lot of, you know, because both of us used to read a lot. We also got a lot of reading material. Like there is no shortage of books to study for IIT. So um, you know, we, we got books, we got some stuff for, from a correspondence course. Um, and then we said, you know, every, every week we would give ourselves a target. We would say, okay, this week, this chapter from maths, this chapter from chemistry, uh, this chapter from physics, uh, we're going to read up the theory material and we're going to start solving the example problems. Um, and I think one of the other things, because, you know, because there was no class, um, there, you know, it was a race against, it was a race against ourselves almost. And so I remember spending, you know, sometimes we would spend easily, um, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, almost an hour on just one problem. And initially it was, um, initially we would feel like, oh, you know, if it's taking us one full hour to solve a physics or a maths problem, uh, you know, in the actual exam, there are going to be 10 or 12 problems and we're only going to have three hours. So how is it going to add up? But I think what, uh, what took us through it, so a couple of things, right? One, I think spending that one hour on that problem uh, really helped us understand all of the theory and how to apply it in depth. Um, we, uh, you know, we grew, uh, we grew into, we kind of grew this habit 
of being able to focus because you know initially it's very hard to take one thing and sit on it for one hour right 15 minutes later you're like oh you know like maybe i should just walk i mean there wasn't whatsapp at that time but maybe today you're saying oh you know let me just whatsapp a friend and ask them or let me go to google and see maybe some maybe the answer is on the internet um and you know while that is available um i think if you if you get used to taking a problem and you know tackling it for a long time in depth um then your mind learns how to you know you almost it's about learning how to learn so you learn how to look at a problem from various sides um and you figure out your own way of solving it and then you know then as time goes on you get better and better and better at it um and i think there is this um, there is um, there is this famous uh, book by this person called malcolm gladwell uh, where he talks about the 10000 hour rule and he says if there is anything that you know he says no matter what your initial skill level and no matter how uh, how you smart how smart you are no matter what tools you have uh, with you if you do something for 10000 hours you get pretty good at it um and i think i don't think we spent 10000 hours solving physics and math problem but we we definitely did spend uh, more than 1000 and i think a lot of uh, you know a lot of it was was about that about just you know putting in that time um and uh, and and getting the, getting that ability to uh, to focus and and just do one thing for a long period of time ashwin i wanted to highlight this experience you had because i think it is it is a it's not the norm uh, amongst parent psychology in india and student psychology in india mm-hmm. and parents often do ask you know what do activities like tinkering which you did with electronics and coding which is something that every child here is doing how do those activities actually help you in the formal education system it's a popular question i think you've actually given us a lot of first hand evidence uh that we can use to answer that question and i think we we can connect the dots between you know you starting to ask that question of how something works at a young age and to actually pursue the uh that search for the answer and, and you got so accustomed to doing that on repeat where you built the uh the various projects you told us about in second grade through fourth grade and then the pursuit of learning through uh the reading that you did I think that whole cycle that you experienced many times built a habit for you. And when I when I talk to parents and I talk to young kids about the value of coding as a problem solving tool, it's exactly that. It's that you have experienced that whole cycle of taking a problem, solving it. And you get that confidence and you know you can even without a formal coaching center, even when without a formal textbook, you know that you can derive these concepts. You don't have to just memorize them. And I think that when you look at Ashwin's story and what he's done even after IIT which we will now talk about it seems like this foundation that he built of asking questions and building things and imagining and then communicating these are all skills that have allowed him to to get uh to where he is today and to do what he does today so Ashwin thank you for sharing that that journey in the interest of time I want to fast forward a little bit I know you've mm-hmm. been through many experiences between IIT and Google but I I'd, I'd like to fast forward to Google because it's a company that all of the kids know they're always wondering what happens in Google what is it like to work in Google uh what are the jobs I can do at Google how can I prepare today to work in Google those are the kinds of questions they send us beforehand so why don't you talk a little bit about what you did at Google uh let's talk about that and then let's talk about examples of jobs that someone can do at a company like Google with this kind of a skill set of coding and engineering um definitely so you know as as you mentioned anshul what what i do at uh, google is called uh, computer uh, is called product management uh, and what that means is i work with teams of engineers and sales people and marketing people and a lot of the other specialized skills um in order to build a product and make it available to a user so um you know as an example one of my one, one of the first products that i worked on uh was google earth how many of you here have heard about or seen google earth sure fans really and it's if you know google earth okay okay i can i can see a few hands how many of you know google maps have you used google maps to get from 
somewhere to your friend's place maybe okay many more hands great uh, so google earth and google maps are part of this one large product that uh, that i was you know that i was fortunate to be a part on and what you know my job there was to understand what users such as yourself you know what you want to do what is it you know so for example you may say oh i want to be able to go from my house to my friend's house my friend just told me their address now i want to know how to go there so starting from something like that and uh, translating down translating that into a variety of engineering problems to solve a variety of computer science or coding problems to solve um and then as you know google has lots of, lots and lots of uh, software engineers people who write code uh, you know people who many years ago were learning to code just as you are doing now uh, and then you know they will work on the various aspects of this and together they will build this big system so to to answer anshul's you know to answer anshul's question i think some of the most uh, some of the most important or uh, kind of large group uh, jobs in a place like google of course software engineering so if you if you if you like coding if you enjoy coding if you get really good at it uh, definitely lots of opportunity there um, there is product management which is what i am doing where people like me enjoy talking to uh, you know enjoy talking to other folks and enjoy thinking about what is it that we should build but then because i have a background in coding because i have a background in computer science i am able to translate that into you know learning to speak technology if i can if i can use that phrase so that's one more there is also program management right some of you might be the types who are your class monitors or who like arranging and organizing things for friends uh, you know when you are working at a large company like google you need to help you know 50 100 200 engineers and product managers all function together well so there is a program manager role um then you actually need to you know take this out and sell it to other companies so there are uh, you know there are sales and sales and marketing roles as well but i think in all of these roles one common thread is having an understanding of technology and having you know being able to uh, being able to look at anything that you are trying to do in the world and asking yourself oh how could i solve you know how could i write you know in its most basic form how could i write a computer program to do to do that and how could i get multiple computer programs to talk to each other to do what i want them to do there's a great point ashwin just mentioned which is that even the roles in sales and marketing and program management even those roles require this ability to understand technology right and so when we when we talk about coding and how it makes a difference at a young age you're really learning a language uh, you've heard me say this before you're learning a language in which you can communicate with technology systems with computers or with mobile devices you can get those things to do what you want them to do and you can use that to solve a problem and what are what ashwin's pointing out is when you go to college and then graduate from college and go to the job uh, landscape and think about what you want to do knowing how technology works knowing how to build your own technology systems whether it's through code or it's by breaking things apart and building them the way ashwin used to do in his early days you will have this ability and a superpower as i call it that maybe not everyone will have and you'll be able to understand problems you'll be able to come up with your own solutions and you'll be able to work in companies whether it's google or your own company that you choose to start to build your own google you'll be able to create while others are using your creations right that's the that's the difference and that's why we really try to build the skill set at a young age and you saw even in ashwin's story he was building from a very young age uh, and then went on to learn computer science and coding in college but because he'd been building for for so long that habit and self confidence was there that allowed him to continue to create now ashwin i want to jump to uh, waymo and let's mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit about self driving cars and maybe we'll spend just 5 minutes on this because then i want to leave another 5 minutes to 10 minutes to for questions from the audience so kids uh, ashwin has sent me a slide i'm just going to share that slide up front on what he does at waymo and while i share that slide i will let ashwin describe his job at waymo which is to build a part of the self driving car system so give me one moment there 
sounds good let's uh, you know while Please he brings up this slide, i think yeah. what i um, you know what i try to do for um, for you guys is you know i was sitting and thinking what now how can i explain everything that um, vemo is trying to build in self driving cars in one simple picture uh, and so you know this is this is an attempt at putting this together in uh, as simple a language as possible so this is this is self driving car software right so this is the code that is running on the car we are for now we are not talking about how to build the actual car or how to build the specialized cameras on it that is uh, that is all that is that all of that is considered hardware we are only talking about the code bit of it uh, and so the way i thought it might be easiest to explain is let's think about what does the car need to do so if, the, if the software is the brain of the car uh, what all what what would this brain need to know in order to drive on a on a real road so the first thing of course is you need to be able to see so the car in this case sees using cameras and li uh, and lidar which is a special kind of radar that uses lasers um, so that's your first box on the right i've you know uh, i've told you the name that we give it in in you know commonly in the self driving car space we call this as perception um so okay so now the car has seen um you know it can see around it um uh, then it needs to figure out where is it in the world and um you know where is it in the world around it so is it in the middle of the road is it on the side is it uh, you know is it at a place where it can take a right turn so it needs to understand where it is and this is called in in industry terms we call this a combination of localization and map so you need to know where you are and you need to know what is the map around you um okay so now you know where you are you can see around you um the next thing to do in order to be able to drive safely is to figure out what everybody else is doing right so there are cars there are cyclists there are people on the road in the in in a place like india there are not just going to be cars and cyclists but there might be bullock carts and rickshaws and cows and dogs and there will be many many other things on the road right so you the car then needs to look at th these other objects and it needs to it needs to predict what are they going to do is this car that is in front of me is it going to go straight can i follow it is it going to take a turn will it come in my way so maybe i should wait for it and all, and this is called as prediction so this is predicting what everybody else is going to do okay so now now we are at a state where the car is seeing it knows where it is it knows what other people are doing now it can plan to drive right so now the car can say i am going to go in this direction with this speed and uh, you know it needs to think about it like okay i'm going to first go for you know 10 kilometers an hour i will travel for the next 50 meters then i will increase my speed then i will take a turn so direction and speed are the two main things uh, and that is called as planning because the car is planning what to do um, and then once this then this is the software right so once this software brain has planned what to do um, you need to send the right commands so you need to in in the most simple sense uh, there are only three things that you need to send a command to there is the steering wheel uh, there is the accelerator and there is the brake and this in the industry is known as the control system um, so you know when when we are talking of building a self driving car uh, especially the software part of a self driving car we are talking of how do we solve all of these problems um, so maybe if you want to jump to the next yeah. image for just a second you see it ashwin uh yes i see it now so this is just you know this is just a quick graphic to you know highlight some of the things so that white car that you see in the center um you know that is the waymo car and as you can so this is kind of like a you know aerial view from a drone uh that taken just this is this is a view that is taken to illustrate how the how the self driving software sees things so if you can see there are all of the you know there's a bunch of other cars in the lane around this car and you see that they have these blue and uh, you know green edged boxes around them and this is what the software is doing right the software is looking at what it is seeing through the camera and the laser and then it is in its mind it is drawing a box around it in its mind as in in the code you draw a box around it because you know it is much easier to think of boxes moving than the actual full shape of the car so you know you draw all of these boxes um so that is a you know that is a bunch of perception going on 
uh, you know, there will be arrows on these boxes then, which will be the prediction. They tell you where these other cars are going to go. And then the light green path that you see for this car. So in the case of this picture, this Waymo car is planning to take a left turn. Um, so that is the plan, right? So the car is planning to drive this. And what it will do is you know, many, many, you know, multiple times every second, it will compute all of this all over again. So every second, you know, 10, 15 times every second, it will say, okay, can I still continue to go in this direction? Is anybody else going to come in the way? And then it drives just, just the same way as, you know, when you're riding your bicycle, um, you know, you're looking around and you're saying, okay, I'm going in this direction, but if something starts to come in the way, you react to it. This is very similar. You know, we have to teach a car how to do that. Uh, so yeah, that's the, that's the problem we're trying to solve. You guys are incredibly lucky that you got to hear this whole explanation in such simple terms directly from someone who's working on it. Ashwin, I found that really helpful as well, personally, to just hear you break down that system, which otherwise can be very complex. You know, it's hard for, for even someone who has done coding for a long time to imagine what all must go into into making a self-driving car work. And I can imagine for all the kids we have in this audience, it must seem even more intimidating. So thank you for breaking it down for us into subsystems and explaining to us um, how it works. Which of those systems do you work on, Ashwin? Uh, so I work on the planning part of the system. So, you know, there are my, the other teams that I work with, you know, they figure out the other bits and uh, the team that I work with, uh, that, that is the team that is trying to say, which direction will we go in? How fast do we need to go? When should we apply the brake? Uh, so yeah, that's uh, awesome. And then yeah, I think with, with so the background, so many that you interesting problems to solve. That, you know, we will be Sorry. we will be doing this for many years. Yeah, awesome. I think this is a great segue into uh, giving the kids a chance to ask you questions. So, kids, raise your hand if you have a question you would like to ask Ashwin, and I'm going to call on you. Uh, I think the first person to raise his hand was Prabir. So, Prabir, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself uh, and go ahead. The so hi, uh, Ashwin. Uh, Uncle, so uh, I this is really intimidating to hear about all these self-driving cars and like tech is moving in the world like so quickly like every day there's some or the other uh, new thing that is being introduced. But my question is, what are the main difficulties and why is why is it going to take time uh, for self-driving cars to come in India compared to why they're already like you know already developing at a high rate in the US and the other countries? Thank you for that question. That's a great question. I think. A couple of reasons. So even even in the US or in China, where self-driving cars are most developed, uh, even here, uh, you know, we don't have that many of them. So for example, the company I work with, Waymo, we have self-driving cars uh, operating in this small town called Phoenix in America. Uh, and if you look at how Phoenix is, it's got very wide roads. The lanes are all nicely marked. It's very flat. So like no hilly, no, no hills very flat, no potholes, no rain, no snow, no fog, uh, very few people on the road. So it's almost everything that the self-driving car has to deal with is another car. And so even we have chosen, uh, you know, a relatively uh, of all the places you could drive right now, self-driving cars are driving in what will be considered the easy place. Um, and I think one of the reasons, one of the hardest problems to solve is uh, with the self-driving car is how do you make sure that you are safe? I mean, how do you make sure that you are safe all the time? And I think the all the time is the hardest bit to solve. You can, it's very, it's relatively easy to be safe 90% of the time, 99% of the time. But you know, when you start going to 99.999%, um, that is when a lot of unexpected, a lot of random things can happen. And I think right now what the self-driving car industry is as a whole, what we're trying to do is we are trying to, Figure out how do you how do you deal with all of these um, all of these very very rare problems uh, that are very hard to teach a car. So I'll give you one tiny example, right? Uh, where there was this particular case when our car was driving, um, and a small flock of pigeons, a small flock of pigeons which were on the side of the road, decided to suddenly go in front of the car and fly off in the other direction. Now, for for you and I, right? For human beings. We have seen birds, we know birds fly. We know sometimes they fly across, you keep driving, it's fine. They will fly away. Uh, but a car, 
like the software it doesn't know that it you know you can teach it to you can teach it to think about one pigeon it you can teach it to think about 10 pigeons then you say oh should we teach it to think about a bunch of pigeons flying across the road maybe we can do that but if you think about it there are so many of these things that can happen that a lot of these things until they happen you've never seen them before and so i think that's the most uh, that is one of the most interesting parts of this problem which is how do you teach the machine to think about things it has never seen before uh, and i think that's why even in the us where people are following ro- rules the roads are wide the lanes are the lanes are marked even there you know there is a lot of time before we can fully solve the problem and then of course when you come to india uh, things get harder because the lanes are not always marked all the people are not driving in the lanes so that makes for example from the diagram that i showed you prediction becomes much harder because in the in america you can say if they are in this lane they will keep driving in this lane and that's right most of the time in india there is no lane so it becomes much harder to decide what the motorcyclists will do what the other bicyclists will do etc and i think that's why it will take a bit more time uh, for self driving cars to come to india okay thank uh, you i just want to congratulate prabir on asking the question so eloquently and what an intelligent question prabir what grade are you in unmute yourself please oh i have to unmute you all right try well, i'm in grade 6 phenomenal okay. question man congratulations on a good Thank question you. and we need we need people like you guys to think about this. so you know you are sitting yeah. in india you are seeing what's happening around every day is going to be people like you who a few years later will probably end up writing the code that makes these cars come to india awesome point thanks thanks ashwin let's go to uh, someone else Let me check screen two as well to make sure I'm not missing anyone in screen two. Okay, back to screen one. We are going to go to the second person who raised his hand. I think that was Arav. Arav, I think that was you. So I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, Please introduce yourself and what grade you're in before you ask the question, just for context. Yeah, I'm Arav. I'm in sixth grade with uh, Prabir. Uh, so my question was, I think I, I actually have two questions. So I found reading about this and I was watching videos. um i think tesla towards radar and what's the difference between radar and lidar because like um like and also uber had an incident with uh, i think uh, a bicycle list on uh, they uh, i think um, something happened there was an accident so what are the drawbacks of each and where are the strong points of each like what are the pros and cons uh definitely thanks uh, thank you for that question and i'm actually very pleased to know that you have done a whole lot of reading clearly if you if you know that tesla is is not using lidar uh, then you already know a lot more about self driving cars than a lot of people got a mini ashwin here who knows what he was doing in second grade right uh arav here is a uh, probably been building for some time now yeah no, that's that's amazing uh, so the the short answer right so it it it, it is a belief right now tesla and you know their their ceo elon musk who is Uh, who is maybe one of the smartest people in the world right now uh, they believe that they can make sense of the world around them using only cameras and and it's quite possible right because as human beings we don't have you know we don't have a radar system uh, we don't have a lidar system we are looking and we are making sense of it so uh, that's what he is betting on i think other companies like waymo or like cruise uh, the way these companies are thinking about it is that a machine sees a machine is a different being so a machine can see in different ways than a human can see so for example even in the you know even in the real world uh, bats bats don't actually see the same way as you and i see you know bats use ultrasound and they are using radar so um, i think the the main distinction there is you know there is some companies like tesla who are saying we think this is enough and they are going to try to solve the problem that way and there are some other companies like waymo and cruise who are saying no we think we need or you know we we think we will get to a better answer if we use um, you know lidar as well as cameras and that's what we are doing and i think you had one more question there which is what is the difference between uh, lidar and radar yeah so, so very simply put it is what kind of wave are you reflecting back so radar is reflecting um, one kind of electromagnetic wave and the advantage of radar typically is you can sense things that are very very far away so 
Uh, you you might might have heard radar is used in uh, you know your air traffic control to see aeroplanes that are uh, you know tens of kilometers away. So radar has that advantage. Radar can in that sense see very far. Uh, yeah. So if you're driving on a long you know if you're dri- driving on a long straight road at high speed, you want to know you want to be able to see things that are further out, and radar is useful there. Uh, lidar uses light, so lidar uses these tiny lasers. And the lidar's advantage is it can see things at a much higher level of detail. It sees things closer by, but it sees things at a much greater level of detail. So lidar can actually make out, for example, if there is a bicyclist or a, a human being or a small child, lidar is actually refined enough that it can tell you the exact shape and outline. So lidar helps you uh, see closer by things much better. and i think the last bit i will call out uh, because you you know because we are also talking of why camera why lidar lidar can see in the dark so in the dark your camera doesn't you know your camera can't pick up a lot because there is not light being reflected from the visible right. spectrum but the laser light can still come back so lidar can see in the dark it can see in fog it can see in smoke uh, and so that that will make the car a uh, super super seer yeah okay thank you thanks for the great question arav i think we have time for one more uh so let me go to ram who has patiently been raising his hand throughout the entire time the questions were being asked so reward your persistence here ram go ahead and unmute yourself uh, thank you sir uh so sir my question is more related to the curriculum of uh, camp k12 i wanted to ask what tools will we be using around it Sure. So, Ram, this this is probably a question that we can also answer outside of the session. The short the short answer is for the AI and computer vision course for autonomous driving, we use Python. That's the short answer. But we'll we'll give you more information outside just so that we can use this platform to let kids ask more questions that we as Camp K twelve would not be the authority on. So, um, over to you guys. I think I did. One, yeah. So, go ahead. I'll actually, Anshul, I'll, I'll add one tiny thing because I noticed when. we were chatting before that a lot of yeah. people were asking what programming language is used in google yes. so the very small answer the very quick answer is more than 20 languages so it doesn't matter what language you are learning most like one most likely google will be using it and two most likely learning one language will make you that much quicker at learning whatever language it is that is used in whichever company you go to that's a really good point and in fact can you talk a little bit about the the tech stack that your team is working on what language do they use uh, or what languages do they use at waymo if you're able to share that publicly uh it's a combination i i i would not be able to tell you the details uh, no publicly but you know it, it's a combination of low level languages such as c c++ there is a lot of analytics work that is being done in things that are python and r and variants of those languages yeah. and then there's actually also custom languages that engineers have created to express things that are easier to do in the self driving car world yeah got it thank you we'll go to aditya chug uh, aditya please unmute yourself introduce yourself what grade you're in and then ask your question hello we can't hear you you're still on mute yeah yeah i am in 6th grade and my question is that if a uh, self driving car has an accident who is responsible for the accident um it this is an interesting question so this is a question that keeps us up at night all the time um and so the who is responsible bit uh, a lot of it depends on you know the or how the actual situation played out um with the one of the advantages we will have with self driving cars is because we have 360 degree video being captured all the time um we can you know we can look back and analyze um uh, and for you know if it if it is indeed the car's mistake um uh, then the company that has built the car uh, will be responsible and i think i'm going to go back to one of the first questions that were asked which is why is this taking so much time to for self driving cars to be everywhere this is one of the reasons why right uh, you know we waymo as well as the other companies that are in this field uh, they are extremely extremely careful and cautious about safety uh, because you know unlike a video game or unlike a website where if you have a small bug you know maybe 
maybe some user can't play the game or maybe the website hangs for a few seconds and that's okay right nothing nothing really bad has happened in the world in self driving cars if you get something wrong on the road someone could get hurt and uh, you know that's 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 why this problem is moving very very slowly the closer you get to the finish line almost the slower you end up moving great ashwin do you want to take one or two more questions i i see anirudh and rag rag have been raising their hand uh, do you yeah, have yeah. a moment I, i can stay on for a bit okay. i'm happy to take so questions. so we'll we'll do the i i want to take a question from someone who's not in 6th grade so if you have a question you're not in 6th grade raise your hand not in 6th grade okay good so uh, we'll we'll ask um, rag rag i think you were raising your rag 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 i don't know what you what the name is go ahead sir actually that's that's not uh, my mom's name or something it's just a user name it's okay that's all right you tell us your real name and tell us what grade you're in and then ask your question my name is ryom and i'm in the grade 3 my question is how does the software actually make the uh, hardware move how does it make the wheel move how does it accelerate the car uh sir so there so there is actually specialized hardware which can talk to the software and make that happen so if i were to give you a very very simple example um or today if you know if you write a piece of code that says turn this particular switch on you know turning on the switch means and this is going back to our electronics knowledge so using software if you say turn this switch on what that means is from an electronics perspective when you turn the switch on electricity will start flowing through a circuit and you will have connected something else to the circuit so for example it could be a motor and you could say when the switch turns on this motor goes on um that motor in in turn you can imagine that that motor might be pressing the accelerator so you could be able to do it in such a way that if you keep this particular switch on for more time you will accelerate more if you put it on for less time you will accelerate less and you will have a separate uh, you know you'll have a separate special piece of hardware that is applying the brake and the wheel and so on so these things are called actuators what they are doing is they are taking um, you know they are taking bits and bytes which is going on and off and they are converting that into actual physical movements of the steering wheel being turned of the accelerator being pressed of the brake being pressed and so on Okay. Thanks Ashwin and thank you for the very uh, advanced question you're in third grade and thinking about this I'm very impressed by the questions Ashwin I I, I know. I'm really <laughs> feeling proud as well that these young kids are are uh, at this level and thinking so so deeply I would love to um uh, I would love for one of our young girls to ask uh, a question one of our girl coders so let me see who is, you guys have all turned your cameras off so one of the girls in the in the session do you guys have any questions uh, we have several girls that are on on page 2 with the cameras off i can see several girl names i don't know if they are the mothers or the the daughters themselves but please raise your hand using the zoom feature if you are a girl and have a question everyone else put your hands down for now okay If you're a girl and have a question, keep your hand raised. Otherwise, put your hand down. So I'm seeing a few names. So Dikshita, do you have a question? I'll I'll try to hold on. Let me find you. Where did it go? Yeah, I think Dikshita has a question. So we are going to ask her to unmute. Go ahead, Dikshita. I've given you permission. Okay, Dikshita, are you there? Okay, it seems like. she may have raised her hand by accident so we are going to go to ansi ansi i'm asking you to unmute we can't see your faces and hence all right okay go ahead. Uh, good afternoon sir my name is ansi anto and uh, my question is here uh, what kind of technology and software have you used it and uh, soft can a uh, self drive car be hacked by anyone hmm uh great question um so on the first part um you know I, i'll i'll call out that that is a that question is a very long answer so the the small slide that i was showing you 
all the things on the right so perception yes. uh, localization prediction all of those are actually very large software projects and a lot of this software is custom built right so it's you know, you know using you know, 10 different programming languages so this, all of this is custom built software um i think the second part of your question is quite interesting can a self driving car be hacked uh, the the very short answer is is yes you know it is a computer system uh, it is connected to the internet and you know if if we have learned anything over the past 20 years is that there is a constant there is a constant race between uh, people who are trying to make their software systems and their websites and their apps better and safer and on the other side hackers who are trying to hack into these things so you know the very very similar thing is going to also be true in self driving cars and in fact uh, at my company as well as the other companies building self driving cars um, there is an entire specialized team who is sitting and saying how would this be hacked and then you know we mm-hmm. so it's almost like you know we we call the the technical name for that is um you know white hat hackers where you know we have a team of really smart people who are sitting there thinking how would i hack this car and then they will try things and if if they see some flaw if they see a gap in the armor they will tell the main software team hey here i found a gap in your code uh you guys fix this so uh that that is always going to be one of the very important challenges that we need to solve thank you ansi and and ansi what grade are you in in the 12th grade sir that's great thank you for your question one more one last question from Welcome, uh from prisha prisha agarwal i'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and then guys if you still have questions after that you can send them on the discord thread for uh for the camp kit 12 talks channel and we'll make sure we share it with our speaker okay uh but for now prisha you are our final a uh, question asker go for it good afternoon sir so just i did have an i don't have any questions related to uh, self driving car or something i have questions related to your career like once you have finished your iit bombay what do you did after that like if you want to develop a career in ai so what are the steps you just took uh definitely so in my case uh, after i you know after i finished iit bombay i went and joined a consulting firm so not a coding firm but a business consulting firm called mckinsey and company uh, and i stayed with them for 5 years before kind of coming back into technology with uh, with google um, and i you know for me that was very helpful uh, in a few ways one i learned how businesses are built i learned how um, how money needs to be made because one of the most important things you know with self driving cars as well is developing all this technology costs a lot of money and one day you need to be able to actually run a taxi service and make that money back so it is always helpful to understand a problem from different angles and every different angle that you know makes you better at uh, solving that problem so that's what i did in my case uh, i think to to answer the second part of your question which is you know to build a career in ai how you know how might you go about it um, i think a few things one of course you know continue your you know continue your learning to code always you know keep yourself curious uh, you know when you see a problem you know when you see something in the world where you say oh you know could this be could this be different how how could i build something how could i tinker with it so keep tinkering uh, you know for example and and i don't know if uh, i'm going to just throw this one out there and anshul can uh, can can scold me for it later but uh, now there is you know you could you could take a small camera you can hook it up to this device called a raspberry pi and you can start running some code on it and then you can have your own little autonomous uh, uh, robot and you can start doing so one of my friends for example um, what his you know what his young son did i think he is in 6th or 7th grade he put this camera outside their front door uh, and he wrote a bit of code to teach it to uh, you know kind of turn on a light if it saw a package so if you have swiggy or uh, delivery or uh, amazon or flipkart delivering a package it leaves a package outside your door um, if that happens a uh, light inside the house turns on so very simple thing actually you know solves you know, solves the problem is someone at my door has something been left outside my doorstep uh, so i think keep tinkering um, and i think uh, the other thing is you know 
for almost anything that you uh, want an answer to, uh, the answer is there in a, in, a, in a combination of your brain and the internet. So, you know, first try to think of how you would solve it, and two, you know, go to Google, search for how to solve it. There, you know, there are lots of online forums where you can talk to other uh, coders such as yourself or all who might be trying to solve this problem. So, I think a combination of all of those things um, will help you. Uh, you know, it will help you get better at solving new unknown problems by yourself. Like I have already developed, I have already tried to develop a chatbot that would solve a particular problem. Like, like Harry Potter, which is, uh, I just developed a chatbot that would, uh, like. You know, answer all the questions related to Harry Potter. So I, that was just the beginning. So how can I just continue? Like, how can I deploy it? How can I continue on my coding skills? Uh, so I think the the first question to ask is, what do you want this chatbot to do next? You know, do you want it to you want it to go from Harry Potter to other uh, fiction? Yes, tales? I like. To, I want to expand it more, of course. And so then, then I think so. You know, keep. Keep thinking and keep asking yourself, where do I get this data from? Can I teach this chatbot to read a book, for example? Because if you can teach it to read a book, then you can ask it to read a thousand books. Then it can ask answer questions about thousands of books. If you can teach it to read anything on the internet, uh, you effectively have Google, right? This is how Google started, right? When when Larry and Sergey were computer science students in Stanford uh, more than 20 years ago, when the internet was still new and it was still small. Uh, this is exactly probably this is what they were sitting and thinking. They were saying, "Oh, I want to ask questions, and I think the answer is on the internet. How do I find that?" And one of them said, "Well, let's write a software program that can start reading the internet," and uh, and it became Google. Thank you, sir. Good questions and and very educational answers. So Ashwin, thank you for a, a very deeply insightful and inspiring session. And this is perhaps setting the record for the longest session we've had. And I think there's still many more questions. Wish we had more time. For those of you who really want to ask a question, didn't get a chance, you can post that on the Discord channel for Camp Q12 Talks, and we'll share it with Ashwin. Um, but, but thanks again, guys. Let's give Ashwin, our guest, a proper Camp Q12 thank you. So a round of applause, please. Thank you, guys. It's okay. been It's been wonderful um, to get all these questions from you. I'm very, very impressed at all at your participation and Anshul and the Camp K-12 team has been telling me wonderful things about all the different uh, code and projects that you're doing. So keep doing that. Uh, best of luck. And, uh, you know, um, one day, maybe five years later, maybe 10 years later, I'm sure there will be self-driving cars in India and some of you people will be the engineers behind it. Absolutely. Thanks again, Ashwin. All, All right. the best to all of you. See you guys next month for next month's talk.